It's here. It is finally game week. Next on Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Cook. Waits for it. Tim Cook. This is no time for that. In the pocket and a sack. Tim Jamison. Brady gets terrific. Throws it. And a touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got it. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Kohler at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. On its way. It's good. He's 5'7", 179 pounds, a junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure coming. Sack. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. Win it. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. Go Blue, I'm Steve Dace, and welcome to another week of Michigan Podcast here on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and of course, many of you are watching us right now, right here on YouTube. And it is the week we have all been waiting for. The long national nightmare is over. College football is back. The most wonderful time of the year is here once more, and Michigan has a lot of demons to slay has a lot of narratives to cast out, uh, has a lot of questions to answer. So you know what? I guess we might as well just get a lot of that out of the way in week one because the Wolverines open up with one of the old rivals back on the schedule, the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. And when you look at the history of this rivalry, there is so much intertwining between these two programs. Michigan literally taught Notre Dame how to play college football. To this very day, they are 1-2 in all-time wins and also win percentage. Newt Rockney based the design of Notre Dame Stadium, the Giant Bowl, off of the even more giant bowl that Fielding Yost built at Michigan Stadium. The two programs have a long and at times checkered history between the two. But since the series was renewed in 1978, after a 32-year hiatus, there have been some interesting trends that have played out more often than not. Let's look at a few of those that, that may give us some hints about what may or may not happen on Saturday night under the shroud of Touchdown Jesus. First of all, Michigan's last road win against a ranked opponent was in this stadium, Notre Dame Stadium against number two Notre Dame in 2006. That's, that's a trend that needs to end. Since the series was renewed in 1978, the Irish have gone on to a double-digit win regular season only once in a season when it loses to Michigan. That was in 2006. So the game historically, as you see the old Notre Dame coach Dan Devine there, who coached the very first game in the renewal in 1978, Ricky Leach versus Joe Montana, uh, that that really has been more historically a barometer for Notre Dame, uh, especially when you look at this particular stat as well. The Wolverines have been a road favorite in South Bend by the way, those old green jerseys, can I just stop? I love, I love this right here. You know, I'm wearing my Desmond Howard throwback, hearkening back to Brett Musburger's call in 1991. It's fourth and one in the final minutes. 
Michigan goes for it. They run the fade route instead of the the belly play for the first down and Brett Mers- Musburger screams out they went for it all and Desmond lays out and makes that great catch as much as I love this uniform this may be the only nice thing I say about Notre Dame this week in my opinion the best uniform in college football I'd put this one in the top three but the best one those green and gold no- uniforms at Notre Dame they need to wear those more often and it's actually going to be a green out First time they've ever done that. It's going to be a green out in South Bend on Saturday night. All right, so back to the trends here. The Wolverines have been a road favorite in South Bend since the series was renewed in 78. Four times. 1986, that was Coach Harbaugh's senior year. 1998, 2002, and 2004. I was actually at that game in 2004. By the way, they failed to cover the spread in all of those games, and they lost three of them outright. The only game they won straight up was Harbaugh's senior year in 1986 and only won that game because one of the greatest kickers in NFL history, John Carney, shanked a field goal at the end and Michigan held on to win 24-23 to in Lou Holtz's first game at Notre Dame. Also, uh, Michigan lost to Notre Dame in 1980, 1982, 1988, 1989, 1990, 1998, and 2004. All seasons when it went on to win or share the Big Ten Championship. Since the series was renewed in 1978, you got to really go there. You can't go back to like the 40s, right? So since the series was renewed in 1978, the Wolverines have five wins in South Bend. They've averaged 9.4 wins in those seasons. They have 10 losses in South Bend, and they've averaged 8.1 wins per season. So historically, all this game really tells you about Michigan is they average one win fewer uh, when they lose to Notre Dame because they lost that game. That, that It doesn't really tell you a lot about the kind of season Michigan's going to have uh, throughout the course of the rest of the campaign, much more than it does Notre Dame. And that's really what all these numbers translate to. Is historically, this game means more for Notre Dame and tells us more about what type of team Notre Dame will have more so than Michigan. But I add one caveat, though. That could be different this year because of what's at stake, the narrative for Michigan. And one of the narrative narratives are Michigan can't win rivalry games, can't win big games on the road, and you still face your two really big rivals, Michigan State and Ohio State, later in the year in November on the road. You've had a, an off season with is Harbaugh on the hot seat? Michigan can't do better than third or fourth place. You do you have you, have, you face all of that onslaught for eight months. If you go out and lay an egg here, Right, because you get the five-star quarterback just literally drops in your lap. How many programs get a five-star quarterback who's already had two years of college development just drop in their lap? It's like Nebraska. It's like Wisconsin with Russell Wilson just drops in your lap. Right? That there are no more excuses for Michigan. So I, I think this is a high-risk, high-reward game for our beloved Maize and Blue on Saturday night. If they win it. Meat is back on the menu and everybody's back on the bandwagon and Harbaugh mania returns. If they lose it, oh boy. If you think the last eight months have been brutal, the media narrative coming off of this loss, triple it. And I think it makes it even tougher for Michigan to attain its season goal. So a lot is riding on this game in South Bend on Saturday night for the Wolverines. We're going to talk more about that with Michael Spath of WTKA in Ann Arbor next. Well, we get asked all the time here on Michigan Podcast by folks, hey, what can we do to help spread the word and support you guys more? Well, one of the big things you can do is support us on Patreon. Help us to cover the cost it takes to put this together each and every week here on YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, etc. And as you can see, if you're watching us on YouTube here, uh, we produce, even during the off-season, uh, content exclusively for our Patreon supporters that we don't make available uh, uh, you know, across our various platforms. For example, uh, the, the more in-depth look at how Michigan's uh, talent stacks up with its rivals that we just kind of touched on in the intro, you can see there, we released that with more analysis on our Patreon page for our Patreon supporters back on August the 4th, right? So we've also introduced a brand new tier, uh, an exclusive booster club, $25 a month, and uh, and you get... 
a chance to get all this kind of access to Michigan Podcast, as well as a shout out on this on the show, your name, business, if you'd like, in the credits. That's just twenty five dollars if you commit to that to, to supporting us on Patreon, uh, above the normal five dollar pledge that uh, several of you have already been very gracious to offer. So thank you for all the support you offer here on Michigan Podcast. Michigan Podcast at Patreon.com. Back here on Michigan Podcast, and yes, to hell with Notre Dame. It is game week, and first up, the Irish, a renewing of one of the great non-conference rivalries in college football history. The two winningest programs, the two programs with the greatest winning percentages, squaring off under the lights in South Bend. By the way, Michigan has never won a night game in South Bend, 1982, 1988. A couple of years ago. And that's kind of when I knew the Brady Hoke era might be in trouble when they shut us out there. So uh, that has not been a kind place at night for the Wolverines. Maybe history will change on Saturday. We're joined now by Michael Spath from WTKA in Ann Arbor. Good to see you, Michael, or hear from you. How are you? Welcome to Michigan Podcast. I'm great, man. We're only a couple of days away from uh, from the game. So I'm on, I'm on cloud nine like probably most Michigan fans are. And uh, we've talked about it uh, many times, Steve, but this is such an interesting season for Michigan football because we're going to know one way or another if this program is trending up uh, towards the goals that we believe Jim Harbaugh is capable of achieving or if it's if it's just kind of stagnating and if we have to kind of change our expectations for what uh, the program, the era of the Jim Harbaugh will look like. Um, I'm incredibly intrigued, incredibly on the edge of my seat to see what the offense has to do, uh, can, can muster to, you know, this weekend. Um, it's an exciting, exciting football game and exciting football season. Well, let's start with the injury news that came out of camp. Uh, the last scrimmage of camp on Saturday, Tariq Black, another foot injury, uh, broke a foot last year, missed essentially uh, the end of the, the last nine games of the season after this went down. Uh, Harbaugh has said that he thought there was a chance we could see him again uh, at some point this season. And and this is a unit where Michigan has recruited very well. And, you know, I, I hate being that fan base. You know, there's certain constants among fan bases in college football where the new guys are always younger and faster and more athletic. Athletic, uh, you know everybody that wins a bowl game is bringing their whole team back the next year, right? I mean, this is this is the fan fiction of college football's laborious off season. But it should be noted uh, in the weeks leading up to this injury. Uh, I mean, I've, I've heard this on your show. There's been a lot of talk about Grant Perry and what he's been doing in camp. I'd read a lot of stuff at both the Wolverine and also at uh, 24-7 Michigan Insider about Nico Collins, who's going to replace Tariq Black in the starting lineup. So this isn't the typical situation where you lose a key player in camp and then suddenly everybody thinks, well, the backup's pretty good. We'd actually been hearing good stuff about two other receivers, maybe even more so than uh, Tariq Black and DPJ so far in camp. But in your mind, what is this injury do for the outcome of Michigan season? You know what? I'm not really sure. And I'll, I'll tell you what, there's, you point out a lot of, you know, really uh, interesting things there and things that do come up with cliches of, oh, well, Tariq Black got hurt, but Nico Collins is better. Now we have heard positive conversation about Nico Collins and a lot of people are expecting him to have a really good football season. Jim Harbaugh said on his Monday coaches show that Tariq Black was in position to start against Notre Dame. So you're losing a starter. At the very least, you're losing someone that was projected to start against Notre Dame that had won the battle in fall camp. So that's a loss. How big of a loss? I'm not really sure. Everybody talks about how good Tariq Black is. Well, as as spectators, as people, as members of the media, we saw him playing three games last year. Are we overdoing how impactful he was? Are we overdoing how much potential he had to contribute at a high level this year, you're not really sure because we have such a small sample size. Mm -hmm. I'll go back to this. In 2015, uh, Jim Harbaugh, when they were drafting their players for the spring game and they were talking about they, you know, they ranked the top 50 players on their team, had Brian Monet ranked as, I think it was number three on their list, one of their top three players Brian Monet was supposed to be. He suffers a foot injury, misses most of the year, 
And did we really, if you go back to 2015, did we really miss Brian Monet? That was when Brian Glasgow emerged. That's when Maurice Hurst started to emerge. That's when Matt Godin started to play a little bit better. I mean, you had guys that filled in for him. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say Nico Collins is better than Tariq Black, but I don't know how good Tariq Black was going to be, and I don't know how good Nico Collins is going to be. But if we get to, if we're three or four games in the season and the wide receivers are the mess that they were last year, yeah, we're going to say we felt it. But if uh, Donovan Peoples-Jones, Grant Perry, Oliver Martin, and Nico Collins form a pretty good group, then we're just going to sit there back there and look there and go, look, Tariq Black hurts, but he didn't kill this team. Yeah, it's it's a loss. It, it's more so, I think, a loss for him individually because of how hard he worked, how hard he had to come back from rehab, how hard he prepared himself last year to make an immediate impact as an early enrollee for 2017. So you feel for him. Uh, you know, I'm wearing my Desmond Howard throwback today, and one of the reasons that Desmond Howard won the Heisman Trophy in 1991 is Derek Alexander got hurt. And they had to refashion the entire offense and create new ways to get the ball to Desmond Howard uh, and and feature him in the offense because he didn't have that other guy who also went on to a long and successful career in the NFL. There's still a position that they've recruited at has a lot of depth. You have a couple of tight ends in Zach Gentry and, and Nick Eubanks who are sub four six guys that you could also uh, you know play at receiver in certain situations as well. So it is a loss, no doubt. But there's a lot of scheme. And, and personnel flexibility there as well. Uh, to me, you look at the depth, and, and you know we we just live in an era. I mean, we just talked. You know, people are talking about you know Tristan Jebbia at, at Nebraska didn't get the starting job. He's leaving. Uh, you know, Brandon Dawkins transfers to Indiana when he loses his job at Arizona to Khalil Tate doesn't get the starting job. He's leaving. You just don't get to you know roll hockey lines too often anymore, particularly on the offensive side of the football. Guys leave all the time. And so, you know, maybe now you'd maybe like to have the insurance policy of that Kakoa Crawford or Eddie McDoom who moved on. But even with Tariq Black's injury, I don't think either one of those guys would be starting uh, or, you know, in a three wide receiver set on Saturday in South Bend anyway. Do you? I don't think they would be if they were still here. No, I don't. I don't think they would be. I think the issue is that you have another injury. Yeah, you know, I agree. Another, now you're one injury I mean, last, away from having this conversation. I agree with you on that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's what it comes down to. I, I mean, you're right. Look at in today's college football, you can't stack uh, the 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 position groups with you know nine, ten, twelve, fifteen scholarship players. Uh, even along the offensive line, you're trying to have. I mean, I remember what they used to always say is that whatever. Put, how many players play? You want to have three, like a three deep of that. So the running back, you know, you you theoretically you want six guys because you have two running backs and one of them's a fullback, a little bit of leeway. Wide receiver now, you play three wide receivers, so you want to have nine scholarship guys. Offensive line, you play five, you want to have 15. And that's the way that it kind of goes. So would you love to have more scholarship wide receivers? Yes. Do they feel really good about Nate Shanley, the walk-on who just received the scholarship? Uh, absolutely. You're, the, the hard part about when you have these guys that move on um, is, is what happens if that competition and the fact that they want playing time happens at the position where you have an injury that gets suffered. Mm-hmm. You know, a year ago, Wilton Spade gets injured. Would you, you know, you'd love to have another quarterback or two quarterbacks. It's just not realistic in today's college football because guys want to play. You know, Tyrone Wheatley uh, just left Michigan at the tight end spot, and now we hear Mustafa Muhammad is a little banged up and probably is not going to be ready to play on, on, on Saturday. Well, you're fine because you have three, you know, redshirt juniors and Zach Gentry, Nick Eubanks, and uh, Sean McCune ready to go. Well, what happens if one of those guys gets injured in the game? Now you're down to two. Now you don't have Tyron Wheatley. Now Mustafa Muhammad's not available to you. So it's one of those things where when you lose guys, you can't expect to keep everybody, but when you lose guys, if you have an injury at that spot or two injuries, it's the second injury that really kind of costs you. But you're right. The Cole Crawford wasn't wasn't going to start on Saturday. Eddie McDoom was not going to start on Saturday. But the depth still takes a hit if you have another one, and that's where it comes in. But whatever everything Michael just said, though, 
is true of all 130 teams, even Alabama. And you go Without back, to, a doubt. you go to go, doubt. go look at the Alabama Auburn game last year, where Alabama had cluster injuries at linebacker, and they're playing two freshmen. Now, you know, one of them's Dylan Moses, that a lot of people thought was the best high school linebacker in America in 2017, but they're freshmen, and you're playing Gus Melzahn's hurry up spread offense, and you got Carry On Johnson, the SEC Player of the Year, and Jared Stidham there at quarterback. They destroyed Alabama in space in that game, not because those guys weren't talented, but they were playing a year before they should have. And so even the, even Alabama, with its recruiting classes, if, if you have the cluster injuries that Michael just articulated, everybody today in college football is vulnerable to that. When I look at this matchup on Saturday night, it's funny, you know, there's so much cross-pollination between these two programs. Uh, you know, I've, I've been to a Michigan-Notre Dame game in South Bend and in Ann Arbor. I went to the 2004 game in South Bend. I spent the day on campus and enjoying the grotto and first down Moses and touchdown Jesus and everything else. And I uh, listened to a lot of their pregame shows. Ty Willingham was the coach there. They were firing him before the game started. Then they go out there and beat us, you know. Uh, and, you know, and we talked about these two trends with this series since it was renewed in 78. That historically, this is much more of a barometer game for Notre Dame. Uh, only one time in a season when it lost to Michigan did Notre Dame go on and have a double-digit victory season. That was in 2006, which was Michigan's last win against a ranked team, by the way, uh, down there in, on the road in South Bend. Uh, on the other hand, you know, Michigan's won Big Ten championships in 1980, 82, 88, 89, uh, all kinds of seasons. There's only a one-win average difference. Michigan average is about eight some odd point wins, 8.1 8 wins in years that it loses to Notre Dame, about 9.3 wins in years that beats Notre Dame. So this is much more of a barometer historically for Notre Dame, Michael, but it kind of feels, given where our program is at, that that may not be the case heading into this year's tilt. What do you think? No, I agree with you. I mean, where there's, uh, you know, as, I, as we said when I opened up the, uh, your, the the segment here, I mean, there's so much to be learned about Michigan football this year, and because of the off season, because of eight and five, uh, there's so much more pressure on Michigan's shoulders. If you want to have the confidence to go out there uh, and win some win some big games on the road that we're going to ultimately face Michigan State, Ohio State, you've got to start with something, and that starts with Notre Dame. Um, I also think the reason that this game is so critically important is, you know, my, my colleague Zach Shaw and I will talk about it. Could Michigan lose to Notre Dame and still make the college football playoff? Yes, it's possible. However, your margin for error goes becomes so razor thin if you lose to Notre Dame because maybe you can get in at 10-2 and two if you lose another one, but chances are you're going to have to run the table because it's so far in the college football playoff – Nobody has made the college football playoff with two losses. Nobody. They've made a couple of teams with one loss, but generally speaking, uh, it's you've got to go out there, you've got to win your conference. So if you don't win your conference and you've got a non-conference loss on your resume, how is that going to look to the committee? Not very good. So if Michigan's ultimate goal is to play for the national championship, you can't lose to Notre Dame. If Michigan's ultimate goal is to beat Michigan State and Notre Dame or in Ohio State on the road, you need the confidence and the 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 memory of winning a big game on the road, which Notre Dame provides, plus the offense with all the question marks needs to get going, uh, plus the defense wants to showcase that it's the real deal and one of the best in the country. On the line, this uh, this opening game for Michigan. You know, I mentioned all the cross-pollination historically with these two teams. Michigan literally taught Notre Dame how to play football. Uh, they're 1-2 all-time uh, in total victories and win percentage. Uh, they Newt Rockney modeled Notre Dame Stadium after the stadium Fielding Yost built uh, there, uh, the, the Big Bowl at Michigan Stadium. And when you look at their teams this year, they look very similar. I mean, Michigan, Notre Dame thinks they have the best defensive front seven, the most athletic one they've had in a while. They like their corners quite a bit. They're not con they're, they're kind of concerned their safeties can cover. That sounds a lot like what Michigan fans think of our defense, as a matter of fact. I don't know that Notre Dame has that edge rusher like a Chase Winovich, let alone a Rashawn Gary, but the rest of their defense looks a lot like the, the way Michigan's defense is built, although it's a different scheme. Offensively, they're, they've got to reshuffle on the offensive line. They lost two top ten picks. They had injuries 
postseason camp and had to move guys like Robert Haney and others around and in and out of the lineup. These two teams look really similar. They've got quarterback issues, uh, albeit it's 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 guys that have played there before. But Brian, uh, you know, Brian Kelly has already said Brandon Winbush is basically on a leash, and if he struggles, Ian Book's going to come in. Michigan's breaking in a new quarterback because last year's guys uh, struggled, and Brandon Peters didn't grab the job when he had the opportunity. So these teams look very similar, Michael, don't they? No, they really do. And in fact, I mean, when you look at this game, I mean, you just spelled it out, and uh, there's some great comparisons. Um, you know, this game comes down for me to to two things. One, which defense is actually, which front seven is actually the best in the country? Um, I would argue that it's going to be Michigan. Uh, I think Notre Dame's interior defensive line is better than Michigan's, uh, but the entire uh, unit, Michigan's got the advantage. Um, I like Devin Bush and Cleek Hudson uh, better than anybody Notre Dame has, although they've got a very, very talented linebacker core, too. Uh, for me, it comes down to the defense and it comes down to quarterback. I like Michigan's quarterback better than I like Brandon Wimbush from uh, Notre Dame. Uh, those are the deciding factors for when I'm making this prediction is uh, is which defense has a better chance of stopping the quarterback or which quarterback has a better chance of doing some things against the defense. And uh, maybe it's the, uh, the biased uh, Michigan fan in me, um, but I'm picking the Wolverines because of that. Are you concerned about the kicking game? So often in week one in college football, it rears its ugly head with no preseason. We're not getting great reports about, uh, you know, where Quinn Nordine has been uh, so far with his accuracy in camp. Uh, An injury at the punter slot. Will Hart, who wasn't great last year. Frankly, nobody was great punting the ball last year. How big of a concern is the kicking game for you right now? I mean, it's always a concern. But I would say because of this Michigan defense, um, this is Michigan defense that had quick cha- quick turnovers. I think they can uh, weather that storm. I don't think the offense will be turning the football over, uh, with especially at the quarterback position like they did a year ago. Um, so while special teams and field position always becomes a big factor in games like this, uh, I think Michigan and you know is a ten point better team than Notre Dame. And with a ten point better team, I don't think special teams is going to be uh, as big of a factor as it has been in the past. So final question, Michael, when we are talking to you next Tuesday for our weekly taping of Michigan podcast, after we've had one game to watch, we're talking about what? What are we going to be talking about seven days from now? Michigan competing for the national championship. No, I think what we'll be talking about is a lot of positive signs for Michigan that this season uh, in year four of the Jim Harbaugh era is putting the program in a place um, to maybe realize the the lofty ambitions of what most Michigan fans had uh, when Jim Harbaugh signed on in January 2015, um, I think we're going to be I think we're going to see the culmination of uh, of what this offense has a chance to be uh, with uh, strong running backs, a quarterback that can do it all, um, skill players at wide receiver and tight end, uh, and a better than what we've seen offensive line and the defense under Don Brown. Um, I think this is going to be the best defense that he's ever had. And that's saying a lot because he's had two awesome ones the past two years. Um, I think we're going to be very, very excited about the rest of the college football season after after this game on Saturday. Well, let's pray uh, that that is indeed what we are going to be talking about at this time a week from now. Michael Spath from WTKA in Ann Arbor. Thanks for joining us again this week here on Michigan Podcast, Michael. Go Blue. All right. Sounds good, guys. Thanks. Coming soon. That's all I can say right now, but stay tuned. You're going to be seeing that logo more often here, and we'll tell you what it means soon. This week's Twitter poll results, what do you think the outcome of the Michigan-Notre Dame game will be? Overwhelmingly, 80% of you thinks Michigan's going to win by three or more, and the rest of those are in single digits. Uh, I think Michigan clearly has the better team. But man, I have just seen some crazy poop in South Bend. I I go back to the year I was there in 2004 and their pregame shows, like the official pregame shows of the Notre Dame Radio Network, were hanging Tyrone Willingham in effigy. And they went out there and beat us. You know, so, I mean, I've seen Reggie Ho kick five field goals. I've seen the win stop for Harry Oliver. You know, I, I've seen Michigan, I've seen a ball deflect off Lake Dawson and Notre Dame overcomes a 10-point victory, 10-point deficit in the fourth quarter. Just some crazy stuff. And it seems like for every Remy Hamilton we've had down there, they've had like seven or eight other things. So if you're a Michigan fan, you know when we go in there, 
We can't just be better than Notre Dame to win a game down there. We have to be a lot better, a lot better. And that's the only thing holding me back is how good can Shea Patterson be in his very first game in a new system, new teammates, new receivers. That's the one thing holding me back from being extremely confident to just being regularly confident. Our question of the week, John Kilpatrick asks, are you surprised that neither Rashawn Gary or Chase Winovich were voted captain? Much more so Chase Winovich, uh, outspoken fifth-year senior, and there are your captains, Ben Bredesen, Karan Higdon, Tyree Kino, uh, and um, Devin Bush. Uh, I'm not surprised Gary was... Well, let me put it this way. I wasn't surprised Gary wasn't named captain until I saw that juniors Ben Bredesen and Dev- Devin Bush were... I, I cannot believe, I, I can't remember if Michigan's ever had two junior captains before. It's rare for Michigan to have one. So when you look at, there were two junior captains and none of them were Rashawn Gary. Chase Winovich, also an outspoken vocal leader of the team, not a team captain. But if you look at a common theme here, those four guys are all not really the most vocal guys. And, you know, there's been this mantra with the Michigan fan base, and I'm a part of it, too. You know, enough talk. Just shut up and play. Show it. Win some games that matter. uh, And and let's let's earn it on the field. And enough with the offseason hype and and Harbaugh mania. And you almost get the sense the team has sort of taken its cue uh, with 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 who it voted for. That's not I mean, Chase Winovich and Rashawn Gary are great players. They might be the best defensive end combination in the history of the Michigan program when it's all said and done, uh, when you look at the numbers they've already put up and, and could put up this year. But I think it's a statement. Those The other four guys are guys that are more of the, you know what, I, I'm just going to kick your ass on Saturday types. And I think that is, hopefully, uh, the team sending the rest of us a message of the way it is focused on how important this coming season that gets underway on Saturday is for the immediate future of the program and really the perception about where it's at nationally. Well, don't forget, there's ways you can keep in touch with us throughout the course of the week. You can follow us on Twitter, at Michigan Podcast, for example. want to thank our friends at Detroit Sports Podcast that helped to spread the word about what we do here each and every week on MP. Subscribe here on YouTube. Leave us a comment. Please share this show with all the Michigan fans you know. You can do the same thing on iTunes and Stitcher if you're listening to the audio version of this. If you have time to leave us a positive review, we would greatly appreciate that as well. Hopefully, we are talking about a great big Michigan victory when we're here again a week from now. Until then, I'm Steve Dace. Go Blue.